Hey everyone, welcome back to The Horror Show. I'm Cecil Laird and this is Startling Storytime, episode number two. Today we are continuing with The Hellbound Heart, written by Clive Barker, also the basis of the original Hellraiser movie. <clears throat> Chapter two, part one. It's not quite what I expected, Julia commented as they stood in the hallway. It was twilight, a cold day in August. Not the ideal time to view a house that had been left empty for so long. It needs work, Rory said. That's all. It's not been touched since my grandmother died. That's the best part of three years. And I'm pretty sure she never did anything to it towards the end of her life. And it's yours. Mine and Frank's. It was willed to us both. But when was the last time anybody saw Big Brother? She shrugged as if she couldn't remember, though she remembered very well, a week before the wedding. Someone said he spent a few days here last summer, running away, no doubt. Then he was off again. He's got no interest in property. But suppose we move in, and then he comes back. Wants what's his. I'll buy him out. I'll get a loan from the bank and buy him out. He's always hard up for cash. She nodded, but looked less than persuaded. Don't worry, he said, going to where she was standing and wrapping his arms around her. The place is ours, doll. We can paint it and pamper it and make it like heaven. He scanned her face. Sometimes, particularly when doubt moved her, as it did now, her beauty came close to frightening him. Trust me, he said. I do. All right, then. Let's say we start moving in on Sunday. Part 2 Sunday It was still the Lord's Day up this end of the city. Even if the owners of these well-dressed houses and well-pressed children were no longer believers, they still observed the Sabbath. A few curtains were twitched aside when Luton's van drew up and the unloading began. Some curious neighbors even sauntered past the house once or twice, on the pretext of walking the hounds, but nobody spoke to the new arrivals, much less offered a hand with the furniture. Sunday was not a day to break sweat. Julia looked after the unpacking, while Rory organized the unloading of the van, with Luton and Mad Bob providing the extra muscle. It took four round trips to transfer the bulk of the stuff from Alexandra Road, and at the end of the day, there was still a good deal of bric-a-brac left behind, to be collected at a later point. About two in the afternoon, Kirsty turned up on the doorstep. Came to see if I could give you a hand, she said, with a tone of vague apology in her voice. Well, you'd better come in, Julia said. She went back into the front room, which was a battlefield in which only chaos was winning, and quietly cursed Rory. Inviting the lost soul round to offer her services was his doing, no doubt of it. She would be more of a hindrance than a help. Her dreamy, perpetually defeated manner set Julia's teeth on edge. "'What can I do?' Kirsty asked. Rory said, "'Yes,' Julia said. "'I'm sure he did.' "'Where is he?' "'Rory, I mean. "'Gone back for another van load to add to the misery. "'Oh!' Julia softened her expression. "'You know it's very sweet of you,' she said, "'to come round like this. "'But I don't think there's much you can do just at the moment.' Kirsty flushed slightly. Dreamy she was, but not stupid. "'I see,' she said. "'Are you sure? Can't... "'I mean, maybe I can make a cup of coffee for you?' "'Coffee,' said Julia." The thought of it made her realize just how parched her throat had become. Yes, she conceded. That's not a bad idea. The coffee-making was not without its minor traumas. No task Kirsty undertook was ever entirely simple. She stood in the kitchen, boiling water in a pan it had taken a quarter of an hour to find, thinking that maybe she shouldn't have come after all. Julia always looked at her so strangely, as if faintly baffled by the fact that she hadn't been smothered at birth. No matter. Rory had asked her to come, hadn't he? And that was invitation enough. 
she would not have turned down the chance of his smile for a hundred Julia's. The van arrived forty-five minutes later, minutes in which the women had twice attempted, and twice failed, to get a conversation simmering. They had little in common. Julia, the sweet, the beautiful, the winner of glances and kisses, and Kirsty, the girl with the pale handshake, whose eyes were only ever as bright as Julia's before or after tears. She had long ago decided that life was unfair, but why? When she'd accepted that bitter truth, did circumstances insist on rubbing her face in it? She surreptitiously watched Julia as she worked, and it seemed to Kirsty that the woman was incapable of ugliness. Every gesture, a stray hair brushed from the eyes with the back of the hand, dust blown from a favorite cup, all were infused with such effortless grace. Seeing it, she understood Rory's dog-like adulation, and understanding it, despaired afresh. He came in at last, squinting and sweaty. The afternoon sun was fierce. He grinned at her, parading the ragged line of his front teeth that she had first found so irresistible. I'm glad you could come, he said. Happy to help, she replied, but he had already looked away at Julia. How's it going? I'm losing my mind, she told him. Well, now you can rest from your labors, he said. We brought the bed this trip. He gave her a conspiratorial wink, but she didn't respond. Can I help with the unloading? Kirsty offered. Luton and M.B. are doing it, came Rory's reply. Oh, but I'd give an arm and a leg for a cup of tea. We haven't found the tea, Julia told him. Oh, maybe a coffee then? Right said Kirsty. And for the other two? They'd kill for a cup. Kirsty went back to the kitchen, filled a small pan to near brimming, and set it back on the stove. From the hallway she heard Rory supervising the next unloading. It was the bed. The bridal bed. Though she tried very hard to keep the thought of his embracing Julia out of her mind, she could not. As she stared into the water, and it simmered and steamed and finally boiled, the same painful images of their pleasure came back and back. Part 3 While the trio were away, gathering the fourth and final trip of the day, Julia lost her temper with the unpacking. It was a disaster, she said. Everything had been parceled up and put into the tea chests in the wrong order. She was having to disinter perfectly useless items to get access to the bare necessities. Kirsty kept her silence and her place in the kitchen, washing the soiled cups. Cursing louder, Julia left the chaos and went out for a cigarette on the front step. She leaned against the open door and breathed the pollen-gilded air. Already, though it was only the 21st of August, the afternoon was tinged with a smoky scent that heralded autumn. She had lost track of how fast the day had gone, for as she stood there a bell began to ring for evensong the run of chimes rising and falling in lazy waves. The sound was reassuring. It made her think of her childhood, though not that she could remember of any particular day or place, simply of being young, of mystery. It was four years since she'd last stepped into a church, the day of her marriage to Rory, in fact. The thought of that day, or rather, of the promise it had failed to fulfill, soured the moment. She left the step, the chimes in full flight, and turned back into the house. After the touch of the sun on her upturned face, the interior seemed gloomy. Suddenly, she tired to the point of tears. They would have to assemble the bed before they could put their heads down to sleep tonight, and they had yet to decide which room they would use as the master bedroom. She would do that now, she elected, and so avoid having to return to the front room and to ever mournful Kirsty. The bell was still pealing when she opened the door of the front room on the second floor. It was the largest of the three upper rooms, a natural choice, but the sun had not got in today, or any other day this summer, because the blinds were drawn across the window. The room was consequently chillier than anywhere else in the house, the air stagnant. She crossed the stained floorboards to the window, intending to remove the blind. 
at the sill a strange thing. The blind had been securely nailed to the window frame, effectively cutting out the least intrusion of life from the sunlit street beyond. She tried to pull the material free, but failed. The workman, whoever he'd been, had done a thorough job. No matter. She'd have Rory take a claw hammer to the nails when he got back. She turned from the window, and as she did so, she was suddenly and forcibly aware that the bell was still summoning the faithful. Were they not coming tonight? Was the hook not sufficiently baited with promises of paradise? The thought was only half alive. It withered in moments. But the bell rolled on, reverberating around the room. Her limbs, already aching with fatigue, seemed dragged down further by each peal. Her head throbbed intolerably. The room was hateful, she decided. It was stale, and its benighted walls clammy. Despite its size, she would not let Rory persuade her into using it as the master bedroom. Let it rot. She started towards the door, but as she came within a yard of it, the corners of the room started to creak, and the door slammed. Her nerves jangled. It was all she could do to prevent herself from sobbing. Instead, she simply said, Go to hell, and snatched at the handle. It turned easily. Why should it not? Yet she was relieved, and the door swung open. From the hall below, a splash of warmth and ochre light. She closed the door behind her and, with a queer satisfaction, the root of which she couldn't or wouldn't fathom, turned the key in the lock. As she did so, the bell stopped. Part 4 But it's the biggest of the rooms. I don't like it, Rory. It's damp. We can use the back room. If we can get the bloody bed through the door. Of course we can. You know we can. Seems a waste of a good room, he protested, knowing full well this was a fait accompli. Mother knows best, she told him, and smiled at him with eyes whose luster was far from maternal. Chapter 3 Part 1 The seasons long for each other, like men and women, in order that they may be cured of their excesses. Spring, if it lingers more than a week beyond its span, starts to hunger for summer to end the days of perpetual promise. Summer, in its turn, soon begins to sweat for something to quench its heat, and the mellowest of autumns will tire of gentility at last, and ache for a quick, sharp frost to kill its fruitfulness. Even winter, the hardest season, the most implacable, dreams, as February creeps on, of the flame that will presently melt it away. Everything tires with time and starts to seek some opposition to save it from itself. So August gave way to September, and there were few complaints. Part 2 With work, the house on Lodovico Street began to look more hospitable. There were even visits from neighbors who, after sizing up the couple, spoke freely of how happy they were to have number 55 occupied again. Only one of them made any mention of Frank, referring in passing to the odd fellow who'd lived in the house for a few weeks the previous summer. There was even a moment of embarrassment when Rory revealed the tenant to have been his brother. But it was soon glossed over by Julia, whose power to charm knew no bounds. Rory had seldom made mention of Frank during the years of his marriage to Julia, though he and his brother were only eighteen months apart in age, and had, as children, been inseparable. This Julia had learned on an occasion of drunken reminiscing, a month or two before the wedding, when Rory had spoken at lengths about Frank. It had been melancholy talk. The brothers' paths had diverged considerably once they'd passed through adolescence, and Rory regretted it. Regretted still more the pain Frank's wild lifestyle had brought to their parents. It seemed that when Frank appeared, once in a blue moon, from whichever corner of the globe he was presently laying waste, he only brought grief. His tales of adventure in the shallows of criminality, his talk of horrors and petty theft, all appalled their parents. But there had been worse, or so Rory had said. In his wilder moments, Frank had talked of a life lived in delirium, of an appetite for experience that conceded no moral imperative. Was it the tone of Rory's telling, a mixture of revulsion and envy, 
that had so piqued Julia's curiosity? Whatever the reason, she had been quickly seized by an unquenchable curiosity concerning this madman. Then, barely a fortnight before the wedding, the black sheep had appeared in the flesh. Things had gone well for him of late. He was wearing gold rings on his fingers, and his skin was tight and tanned. There was little outward sign of the monster Rory had described. Brother Frank was smooth as a polished stone. She had succumbed to his charm within hours. A strange time ensued. As the days crept towards the date of the wedding, she found herself thinking less and less of her husband-to-be, and more and more of his brother. They were not wholly dissimilar. A certain lilt in their voices, and their easy manner, marked them as siblings. But to Rory's qualities, Frank brought something his brother would never have, a beautiful desperation. Perhaps what had happened next had been inevitable, and no matter how hard she'd fought her instincts, she would only have postponed the consummation of their feelings for each other. At least that was how she tried to excuse herself later. But when all the self-recrimination was done with, she still treasured the memory of their first and last encounter. Kirsty had been at the house, hadn't she? On some matrimonial business when Frank had arrived. But by that telepathy that comes with desire and fades with it, Julia had known that today was the day. She'd left Kirsty to her list-making or such-like, and taken Frank upstairs on the pretext of showing him the wedding dress. That was how she remembered it, that he'd asked to see the dress, and when she'd put the veil on, laughing to think of herself in white, and then he'd been at her shoulder, lifting the veil, and she'd laughed on, laughed and laughed, as though to test the strength of his purpose. He had not been cooled by her mirth, however, nor had he'd wasted time with the niceties of a seduction. The smooth exterior gave way to cruder stuff almost immediately. Their coupling had had, in every regard but the manner of her acquiescence, all the aggression and the joylessness of rape. Memory sweetened events, of course, and in the four years and five months since that afternoon, she'd replayed the scene often. Now, in remembering it, the bruises were trophies of their passion, her tears proof positive of her feelings for him. The day following, he'd disappeared. Flitted off to Bangkok, or Easter Island, some place where he had no debts to answer. She'd mourned him. Couldn't help it. Nor had her mourning gone unnoticed. Though it was never explicitly discussed, she had often wondered if the subsequent deterioration of her relationship with Rory had not started there, with her thinking of Frank as she made love to his brother. And now? Now, despite the change of domestic interiors and the chance of a fresh start together, it seemed that events conspired to remind her again of Frank. It wasn't just the gossip of the neighbors that had brought him to mind. One day, when she was alone in the house and unpacking various personal belongings, she came across several wallets of Rory's photographs. Many were relatively recent. Pictures of the two of them together in Athens and Malta. But buried amongst the transparent smiles were some pictures she couldn't remember ever having seen before. Had Rory kept them from her? Family portraits that went back decades. A photograph of his parents on their wedding day. The black and white image eroded over the years to a series of greys. Pictures of christenings in which proud godparents cradled babies smothered in the family lace. And then photographs of the brothers together as toddlers with wide eyes, as surly schoolchildren snapped at gymnastic displays in school pageants. Then, as the shyness of acne-ridden adolescence took over, the number of pictures dwindled until the frogs emerged, as princes, the other side of puberty. Seeing Frank in brilliant color, clowning for the camera, she felt herself blushing. He had been an exhibitionist youth, predictably enough, always dressed a la mode. Rory, by comparison, looked dowdy. It seemed to her that the brothers' future lives were sketched in those early portraits. Frank the smiling, seductive chameleon, Rory the solid citizen. She had packed the pictures away at last and found, when she stood up, that with the blushes had come tears. 
not of regret. She had no use for that. It was fury that made her eyes sting. Somehow, between one breath and the next, she'd lost herself. She knew, too, with perfect certainty, when her grip had first faltered. Lying on the bed of wedding lace, while Frank beset her neck with kisses. Part 3 Once in a while she went up to the room with the sealed blinds. So far they'd done little decorating work on the upper floors, preferring to first organize the areas in public gaze. The room had therefore remained untouched, unentered indeed, except for these few visits of hers. She wasn't sure why she went up, nor how to account for the odd assortment of feelings that beset her while there. But there was something about the dark interior that gave her comfort. It was a womb of sorts, a dead woman's womb. Sometimes, when Rory was at work, she simply took herself up the stairs and sat in the stillness, thinking of nothing, or at least nothing she could put words to. These sojourns made her feel oddly guilty, and she tried to stay away from the room when Rory was around, but it wasn't always possible. Sometimes her feet took her there without instruction to do so. It happened thus that Saturday, the day of the blood. She had been watching Rory at work on the kitchen door, chiseling several layers of paint from around the hinges, when she seemed to hear the room call. Satisfied that he was thoroughly engrossed in his chores, she went upstairs. It was cooler than usual, and she was glad of it. She put her hand to the wall and then transferred her chilled palm to her forehead. No use, she murmured to herself, picturing the man at work downstairs. She didn't love him. No more than he, beneath his infatuation with her face, loved her. He chiseled in a world of his own. She suffered there, far removed from him. A gust of wind caught the back door below. She heard it slam. Downstairs, the sound made Rory lose his concentration. The chisel jumped its groove and then sliced deeply into the thumb of his left hand. He shouted as a gush of color came. The chisel hit the floor. Hell and damnation! She heard but did nothing. Too late, she surfaced through a stupor of melancholy to realize he was coming upstairs. Fumbling for the key, an excuse to justify her presence in the room, she stood up. But he was already at the door, crossing the threshold, rushing towards her. His right hand clamped ineptly around his left. Blood was coming in abundance. It welled up between his fingers and dribbled down his arm, dripping from his elbow, adding stain to stain on the bare boards. "'What have you done?' she asked him. "'What does it look like?' he said through gritted teeth. "'Cut myself.' His face and neck had gone the color of window putty. She'd seen him like this before, and had on occasion passed out at the sight of his own blood. "'Do something,' he said queasily. "'Is it deep?' "'I don't know,' he yelled at her. "'I don't want to look.' He was ridiculous, she thought, but this wasn't the time to give vent to the contempt she felt. Instead, she took his bloody hand in hers and, while he looked away, prized the palm from the cut. It was sizable, and still bleeding profusely. Deep blood. Dark blood. "'I think we'd better take you off to the hospital,' she told him. "'Can you cover it up?' he asked, his voice devoid of anger now. "'Sure. I'll get a clean binding. Come on.' "'No,' he said, shaking his ashen face. "'If I take a step, I think I'll pass out.' "'Stay here, then,' she soothed him. "'You'll be fine.' Finding no bandages in the bathroom cabinet the equal of the staunching, she fetched a few clean handkerchiefs from the drawer and went back into the room. He was leaning against the wall now, his skin glossy with sweat. He had padded in the blood he'd shed. She could taste the tang of it in the air. Still quietly reassuring him that he wouldn't die of a two-inch cut, she wound a handkerchief around his hand, bound it on with a second, then escorted him, trembling like a leaf, down the stairs one by one like a child, and out to the car. At the hospital they waited an hour in a queue of the walking wounded before he was finally seen and stitched up. It was difficult for her to know in retrospect what was more comical about the episode, his weakness or the extravagance of his subsequent gratitude. She told him when he became fulsome 
that she didn't want thanks from him, and it was true. She wanted nothing that he could offer her, except perhaps his absence. Part 4 Did you clean up the floor in the damp room? she asked him the following day. They'd called it the damp room since that first Sunday, though there was not a sign of rot from ceiling to skirting board. Rory looked up from his magazine. Gray moons hung beneath his eyes. He hadn't slept well, so he'd said. A cut finger, and he had nightmares of mortality. She, on the other hand, had slept like a babe. What did you say? he asked her. The floor, she said again. There was blood on the floor. You cleaned it up. He shook his head. No, he said simply, and returned to the magazine. Well, I didn't she said. He offered her an indulgent smile. You're such a perfect housefrau, he said. You don't even know when you're doing it. The subject was closed there. He was content, apparently, to believe that she was quietly losing her sanity. She, on the other hand, had the strangest sense that she was about to find it again. And that's where I'm going to end the second episode of Startling Storytime featuring The Hellbound Heart by Clive Barker. Um, that is uh, chapter two and three with all the parts in between. Um, we are at page 209. This story ends at page 278. So it started at... Mm -hmm. Started at 185, so we're going about um, about 11 to 12 pages per episode right now. That means that we are probably about four episodes away from the end of this story, you guys. So um, let me know how you're enjoying it. That was the second part. Um, make sure you like the video if you guys enjoyed this. I greatly appreciate your <laughs> sticking through while I just read this book to you. I'm actually really enjoying this, so thank you very much for coming back and watching more of it. Like I said, let me know in the comments down below what you're thinking of the story so far. How much is it reminding you of Hellraiser? It's very similar, obviously. Julia, you know, Kirsty, um, Rory, all that good stuff. That was all from the book. Uh, so I, uh, I want to know what you guys think. So uh, let me know in the comments down below. Until the next episode of Startling Storytime, I've been Cecil Laird. And remember, stay scared.